Hello everyone, this is Norm again. Thanks for joining one more time. I am recording this right before Mother's Day, uh, although it's probably not going to air until shortly after Mother's Day, so I'm afraid this will not work well as a reminder, but if you missed it, or frankly if you under-delivered, you know who I'm talking about, Gary. That 7-Eleven Rose is not getting the job done. If you have not adequately paid your respects, then I'm giving you permission now, go ahead and do a follow-up. Be nice to your mamas. With that out of the way, hello everyone, greetings. Hey, remember last week how Redfall dominated the news cycle? How it was the worst thing to ever crawl out of a AAA developer studio? How the gaming industry, and Microsoft in particular, would never live down the shame? Well, that was last week, nobody cares anymore. Now Tears of the Kingdom is out. It is always big news when there's a new Zelda game released. Ever since Ocarina of Time, which was, uh, which was functionally The Legend of Zelda's Grand Theft Auto 3 moment, I mean, yes, it was a big deal before, but this fundamentally changed how the audiences responded to it, how each one became an event. Since that time, the release of a new Zelda game has always been a cause for celebration for the faithful. And for me personally, I think it's okay. In complete honesty, even including uh, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, I've played all of them, uh, except for the one for the Wii U. I did not play that one. But having played well within 90% of the released Zelda games, I have never finished any of them. Now, that alone is not strong condemnation. The truth of the matter is, is that I am not a completionist when it comes to games. Even games I really, really like. Like, uh, I, I'm pretty sure at this point I've put in actual years in Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and I have still never rolled credits on that one. So I do want to make it known, I do understand why people like Zelda. I enjoyed my time with pretty much every Zelda game up until about the three-quarter mark, and then it started getting kind of samey and grindy. And at least two of them uh, were entries that I went back to. Like, I had played uh, Ocarina of Time when it came out, but did not play Majora's Mask until much later, and by that point, time and mechanics had kind of moved along. But I do certainly understand the appeal, they just didn't have that magic something that just kind of pulled me across the finish line. Skyward Sword, that was the one I hadn't played. Okay, so yes, I do 100% uh, acknowledge the artistry and uh, craftsmanship behind the Zelda games, and I am willing to give pretty much every new entry a try, not necessarily at a $70 price tag, but whatever the magic formula is to capture my, uh, capture my undivided attention, it doesn't have it yet. I'm pretty sure that the disconnect there probably boils down to thematic or story elements. Like the world itself, and I know that's kind of a silly thing to say because uh, that's one of the big things that gets praised with the Zelda series, but for me the uh, the landscapes have always, even going back uh, to like Ocarina of Time, it's always been just a little too desolate for me. It's never been a uh, really fleshed out populated kingdom. When I played Breath of the Wild, the, uh, the game that it really reminded me of from tone was uh, Shadow of the Colossus. Which, if you've played Shadow of the Colossus, you know that's not an insult. Shadow of the Colossus is a, a, a lovely, very artistic game, but it's not when you pop in for party time. We're not necessarily talking Ingmar Bergman levels of ponderousness, but it is a very desolate, very quiet, solitary experience. And you really have to come into that sort of thing with the uh, in the right mood. Like, I've spent all day working at a computer. I don't really need more desolate isolation. It doesn't matter how pretty it is, I can get that at home. If it was a bit more uh, more populated, a, a more living experience, I think I wouldn't have any trouble with it. Uh, with with one major exception, the Nintendo Switch itself is a very odd machine. For me, Breath of the Wild did not work as a mobile experience. I felt that it was designed for a bigger screen. While it's kind of a miracle that it was able to perform on the handheld version at all, I'm pretty sure that was an afterthought. I'm sure they intended this game to be played as a console game. But because of the way my uh, my Switch is set up, which it's it's really not on my top tier of consoles. That is, when it comes to easy access, the Xbox is first, the PlayStation is second, and the Switch actually requires manually flipping the input. And yes, I realize I am describing things that I have full control over. I, I know this is not Nintendo's fault for putting my Switch in an inconvenient spot or my own general laziness. But the end result is, unless I'm uh, really specifically planning to settle into a game, uh, a game on the Switch, then my go-to is literally just to pick it up off of its uh, little dock there and play it in handheld mode. That worked out fairly okay for, like, Animal Crossing, but uh, 
for Zelda woefully inadequate. For all the design innovation of the software, the Switch hardware itself is the most artless answer to the question, how can we get this TV game into your hands? It is not an ergonomic device. It is uh, functionally a slab with Nintendo's little horrible dime store half controllers kind of just buttoned onto the sides. It is not in any way designed to be comfortable. It is designed to pop together and apart easily. That's the priority. I'm not going to uh, praise the artistry of the Steam Deck, which uh, weighs about the same as a newborn and sounds like a dustbuster running, but it is much more comfortable to play on. From having actual grip on the controllers, that uh, you know, having a little actual mass to hold on to, rather than entrusting your grip to whatever traction is already in your fingers thanks to impending arthritis, or having a screen that you can actually see. And okay, I'll cop to this one. I'm not a spring chicken. My eyesight has never been good. The Switch's main demographic is considerably younger and probably much better sighted than me, so I can't really count that too far against the uh, the design of the console. But at the same time, the Steam Deck is much easier to see. All in all, handheld gaming on the Switch is a painful experience, and I just don't use it enough to justify giving it kind of a permanent slot on the input roster. So there, there it stands. What can the Nintendo Switch do to appease me specifically? Answer, probably nothing. They probably don't care. I might be wrong, maybe Miyamoto will look up from swimming laps in his pool of Mario money and wonder to himself, how can we get a better market share of the nearsighted schlub demographic? Little known fact, Shigeru Miyamoto thinks in English. In any case, chances fairly low, I would say. But yeah, Tears of the Kingdom, uh, reviewing insanely well, tens almost all the way across the board, which is not something you see a lot of these days. And in fairness, if you do, re uh, if you do read the reviews, those tens are coming through with a lot of caveats. For all the uh, performance woes that have been made a big deal about, well, about Redfall certainly, but I would say more apt comparison would be Jedi Survivor because uh, it at least reviewed very well in spite of the performance woes, and yet those performance woes were very distinctly part of the uh, detractions on the actual score. Tears of the Kingdom does seem to have scraped a, uh, a 10 simply on the basis of pulling off the technological marvel of functioning at all on the the lousy Switch hardware. I mean, as an old school gamer myself, frame rate has never been a deciding factor for a game, but I can't think of any other modern release where the review will point out that the game is regularly dropping into the low 20s, and that still doesn't knock even a fraction off of the final review score. And I don't think that's necessarily uh, like Nintendo fanboyism, because it is uh, consistent across all the reviewers. It is a very highly reviewed game, but the fact that they wouldn't knock it down to like even a 9.9, .9, I I feel like we're just witnessing uh, members of the uh, the gaming industry sort of just spontaneously all deciding that the gaming industry needed a win this year, and Zelda was going to be the most likely recipient. I can understand the impulse. Anyway, that is Tears of the Kingdom. I have not played it. I don't actually intend to play it anytime soon, but apparently a good time for those choosing to do so. Okay, next up, this isn't really a news thing, but I uh, did want to drop a little note in regards to a film I watched recently. It's not something I normally do, but this one defied my expectations by a bit, and I had a very good time with it. It is a, uh, a film called Deadstream, as opposed to, of course, Livestream, and that uh, ties into the plot of the film. This is an indie horror film directed by Joseph Winter. Uh, apparently his film directorial debut, although uh, according to his credits, he did have a segment uh, in the wildly uneven VHS series. Anyway, this is not going to be a full review. This is basically just a recommendation. Those who know me know that I have a pretty low opinion of modern horror in general. Not to go old man yells at cloud on you, but in these modern times, the horror genre has largely degenerated into a glum, desaturated, CG-riddled landscape of short film concepts that have been inadvisably expanded to feature length. 
I could go on and I will if I corner you at a party, but Deadstream really did surprise me. It is, uh, it is as the name implies, uh, presented as a live stream, a, a kind of YouTube-ish or Twitch-ish live stream, in which our uh, self-obsessed influencer main character, played by Winters himself, is pulling off a spend the night in a haunted house stunt. The twist here is not super difficult to see coming, but uh, in fairness, I guarantee it was not the intention to be. The pleasure of this film is in the execution and in the performance of Winters himself, who uh, remains charismatic despite playing a character you'll spend at least the first half of the film rooting against. It's genuinely funny, the writing is witty, uh, and there are several genuine scares in the film. This one played to a full VR audience in big screen, and they ate it up. Anyway, modern horror, it's clever, it doesn't suck. Uh, and it is streaming right now on Shudder. And I would say uh, keep an eye on the director Winters. I, I imagine you're going to see more from him. Get in now on the ground floor of fandom while it's still cheap. Okay, to close out today's episode, we're going to end appropriately with a few facts about The Legend of Zelda. Starting with one that has been in plain sight for a while, but uh, not widely noticed. Possibly because it's not that interesting, we're not making judgment calls. But did you know that Link is left-handed? Yes, he can walk across lava and he can hang glide over dewy meadows, but good luck to him cutting a straight line with a regular pair of scissors. Anyway, this has always been the case. You can go back and look uh, for yourself. Link has always been a sinister southpaw, with one notable exception. When Nintendo created a Wii port of Twilight Princess, they realized that Link's natural left-handed tendencies would be at odds with most right-handed gamers utilizing motion controls, and as a result, they mirrored the entire game. Not just Link himself, but the entire game is presented flipped. A significant canon-breaking change, and that's exactly the sort of trouble that you get into when you allow these genetic deviants to infiltrate our culture. At least Link doesn't have red hair. Second, did you know that the name Link was chosen to be symbolic? Or at least that's what Miyamoto said. My own personal guess is that the name Link has about as much symbolism as Bob Dugnut, but on the record, it, uh, it was chosen because the name Link symbolizes a connection. A connection not only to the past and the future, but also a link to you, you the gamer. Link was supposed to represent you in the world. Granted, the whole left-handed thing goes against the majority of uh, the population in that regard, but it was stated that Link was silent in order to maintain a connection with the player, that you were linked together. Finally, we already knew that Princess Zelda had an amazing PR team, given that she has top billing in the series despite relatively low airtime. But did you know that there have actually been a few games of the series where she doesn't appear at all? Zelda does not appear in Triforce Heroes, she does not appear in Link's Awakening, and in a game that many would claim is one of the best in the series, Majora's Mask, she only appears in a brief flashback. In point of fact, it becomes apparent that the reason it's called The Legend of Zelda is probably because most citizens of Hyrule can't be certain she actually exists. Anyway, that finishes it up this time. Uh, this is Norm again. Thank you very much for making it all the way to the end of the episode. If you enjoyed the episode, leave a like. Uh, even better, leave a comment. YouTube loves them comments. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification button if you ever want to see us again. And if you want to go one step further, uh, you can support us directly on our Patreon. Link is in the description. Direct line to me. Get comics before anybody else. Otherwise, thanks for spending some time with us today. We'll see you next time. Y'all take care. Norma way. Like the video, video gamers? We have more such wonders to show you, and all you have to do is subscribe and hit the notifications button. I mean, you don't have to. Also consider becoming a patron by following the link to our Patreon page, where we turn your cash into videos, comics, and games using the darkest of dark magics. But mostly just cash.